Today, we're talking about religions of Japan. I want to start with a broad stroke kind of idea about the world religions. A world religion is generally defined as one that affects a significant amount of population and is not limited to one geographical boundary. In fact, Shinto, the folk religion of Japan, is probably one of the ones that is most geographically limited, but it does exist in other parts of the world because of Japanese communities elsewhere. The oldest religion, this list is according to um, our best understanding of when the various religions were started, the oldest religion in the world as a formal religion is Hinduism, which began as far back as 4000 BC in the early Vedic period in India, somewhere between 4000 and 2500 BC. Um, the next oldest world religion is Judaism at 2000 BC. Buddhism comes along around 560 to 490 in India. The Chinese traditional religions, which include Taoism, Confucianism, and some other shamanic religions in China, come along around 500 BC. Shinto, Jainism, also around those same times. Um, one way to understand the various religions or to think of them as families, there are three or perhaps four uh, families of religions of the world. The first one, and by far the largest, are the Abrahamic monotheisms. The religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all three of which maintain the existence of one God, and all three of which trace their lineage back to one man, and that is Abraham, who lived about 2000 BC. Um, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, all three are therefore called Abrahamic religions, and they are all three, the three great monotheisms. The second family of religions are the Dharmic religions that began in India. The word Dharma in Sanskrit means teaching. So the Dharmic religions include Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. Now, I'm not going to get into Jainism or Sikhism or Hinduism. If you want to find out about those, you know, buy me a cup of coffee at the Yacht Club and I'll be happy to talk to you about it. But uh, we are going to be talking today about Buddhism. And Buddhism is complicated, <laughs> and we'll get into how that is. The Buddhism that we experience or that you hear about in East Asia, where we are now, that is uh, Korea, China, Korea, and where we are, Japan, is very different than how Buddhism started as the Dharmic religions. In fact, the third great family of religions are the Taoic religions, uh, based upon the idea of the Tao. I'll talk about that a little more. These are the religions of the Far East, China, Japan, uh, includes Taoism, Confucianism, and Shinto, but versions of Buddhism as well. Buddhism today is seen as having two roots, one in the Dharmic religions and one in the Taoic religions. And if you ask me, the, the Dharmic Buddhism and the Taoic Buddhism are f fundamentally different. They are so different, it's very, it's very hard to say that they're the same religion, but they have some of the same foundations. It's possible that we could identify a fourth family of religions, which are the Iranian or the Persian religions. These are not always included now because uh, these are all religions in the Persian part of the world that uh, predate Islam, and there are not large populations of these today. There were at one time, there's not now, and so um, sometimes it's not included as a family anymore. It's Zoroastrianism, Mandeism, and the Kurdish Yazdanism faiths. You've probably heard or seen reports about the Yazidis that were being persecuted by uh, ISIS or ISIL, depending upon how you prefer to refer to them, um, because that is a very ancient pre-Islamic belief. So sometimes we would include those, but those are very small populations relative to the, uh, to the other world religions. Now, there's one thing that you may have noticed in my first chart, and that is, for a reason that no one really understands, no one can explain this, Several of the world's major religions all occurred within a hundred years of each other in terms of their origin. Uh, Taoism and Confucian well, Buddhism first, Taoism and Confucianism as Chinese traditional religions, Shinto in uh, Japan, and Jainism in India all occurred right at the same time. The founders of Taoism, Confucianism, and Buddhism were all alive at the same time in different, very different parts of the world. And nobody, nobody really knows why there was this burst of religious creativity and energy 500 BC. But it's important enough that they have a name for it. They call it the Axial Age, when these religions all uh, began. So we're going to be talking about some of those today. In Japan particularly, um, 
it's a little complicated to identify people's religions because the Japanese have a very particular way of believing uh, about their, their face of Shinto and Buddhism. When asked to check a box on a survey as to what religion they belong to, 40% of all Japanese say they don't have any religion, that they're non-religious. However, 80% of Japanese, it's estimated, have a, um, a Shinto shrine in their home. 35% of the people say that they're Buddhists, but it's estimated that 60% of the people have a Buddhist shrine in their home. Um, and so you get you run into kind of that concern. If it's 80% practicing Buddhists and 60% practicing Shinto, you know, Japan has 140% of the people. No. Um, it's because in Japan they have de developed historically a very unique blending of Shinto, the original folk religion of Japan, and uh, Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism particularly, which I'll explain when we get a little more into Buddhism. Um, this, this syncretism or blending of Shinto and Buddhism is called Shinbutsu Shugo. If you're talking to a Japanese person, and I've made a point of this as we've traveled around, because this is our, um, our fifth cruise in this series. We started on um, this four years ago, was Maybe it? Uh, something, you know, like that. something like that. I mean, we don't, we've been in Japan for quite a while. And I always ask our guides, what, you know, are you Shinto, a Buddhist? And they always go, well, it's complicated, you know? And I go, so, uh, Shinbutsu Shugo? And they go, yes, yes, you understand. For them, it's not one or the other. And they don't check the religion box because for them, a religion is some organized, um, an organization that you sign up for and you have a, a set of beliefs. For most Japanese, Shintoism, and even Buddhism, if they practice it, is a way of life. It's part of their culture. It's not an organized uh, something that you join and to the exclusion of other things. And so for that reason, they tend not to check the box to say that they have, that they are Shinto, or they are Buddhist, or they are something else. There are uh, less than 2% Christians in uh, Japan, and that's primarily because of some, some quite severe uh, persecutions that existed down through history. At one time, the Catholic Christian faith had uh, Francis Xavier, the great uh, saint of the, um, of the Catholic Church. He was a Jesuit and a missionary. He came to Japan and had quite a bit of success, but then later on, most of those were either driven off or killed in terms of his converts. So I first want to talk a little bit more specifically about Shinto. For most of us in the West, Shinto is the greatest mystery uh, because you, we don't run into it a whole lot. And I've had so many people on this cruise say, okay, I understand Buddhism, I understand other religions, but what, what is up with Shinto? Because it is very different. Shinto, or to use the Japanese name for it, Kami no Michi, um, and by the way, Ordinarily when I do slides, I don't have this many words, but because we're dealing with, with kind of complicated concepts here, I want you to be able to see the explanation as well as hear me talk about it. Shinto literally means the way of the gods. The word for the gods I'm going to discuss is kami, K-A-M-I. The shrine, the Shinto shrine that uh, many Japanese, as many as 80% of Japanese have in their homes, is called a kamidana, which literally means a god shelf. Now they don't mean God, Kami does not mean God in the way that most monotheists, most of us, the culture that uh, most of us probably come out of, think about God, with a capital G, one creator God. Uh, but rather they are the spirits, the essences, the divine beings that are around us. It's probably, and this is, there are all, all sorts of ways this is a wrong analogy, but a good way to think of it might be to think of Kami the way that a Roman Catholic would think about Catholic saints that they, many of, you know, most of them used to be people, they uh, are no longer alive, but they still exist in a spiritual sense, you can communicate with them, you can ask them to uh, perform favors for you, if you will, or to meet needs that you have. This is very much the kind of relationship that a Shinto uh, person, uh, practitioner, would have for the kami. It is, in many ways, an animistic religion, although sociologists argue about this all the time, we're, we're, whether it truly is animistic. An animistic religion is one that believes there are spirits in all things. There is uh, Native American religions, for instance, we'll talk about the spirit of the wolf and the spirit of the mountain and uh, various other kinds of spirits. Well, it's true within Shinto that people will worship, and I put quotes around that word because 
It's not worship in terms of, um, you know, the, the kind of worship that you might see in the West, but rather a showing of respect for, an acknowledging of the continued existence of their ancestors or emperors or great leaders from the past um, who, have, who have continued on as great spirits, but also there are spirits of major natural wonders. Um, the Fujisan, the Mount Fuji, is considered to be a great kami. There is a great spirit to that mountain. Um, we visited a couple times the highest waterfall, in, uh, which is in uh, Shingo, Shindo, Shindu, Shin, Shing. <laughs> it's in a city in Japan and up on a mountain. Um, it, I, the, I confuse the name sometimes. We've been back to places several times. Um, and it's the highest waterfall, and they believe that there is a great kami associated with that waterfall. And so natural features. Um, one of the things about Japanese gardens, for instance, is that they often will have, will have features of large rock formations and that sort of thing, because they believe there may be great kami associated even with stones that have character. The, sort of the definition of whether or not a kami is there is if it is a place that engenders awe, and wonder in a person. That's the primary sense that you have when you're in the presence of a kami. And they will have uh, shrines, and I said before, if you hear shrine, it means Shinto. If you hear temple, it means Buddhism. And sometimes they're right together. There are even places where, temp where Buddhist temples and uh, Shinto shrines are managed by the same people. You know, they, they are, they're together as one, and you can you can go to the shrine, and then you can walk right next door and go to the temple. When I say next door, I mean like 30 feet away. So um, it's a very much an integrated kind of idea, this Shinbutsu Shugo. Um, the Shinto faith is very much about purification. It's very action-centered. It has less to do with what you believe in than what you do to show reverence for the kami, for the spirits that exist. Um, it is linked to certain it's linked to Taoism because the idea that there are these spiritual essences around is very much like Taoism the Tao I'll talk about in a minute um, so there, there's a there's a link there between Chinese Taoism and Shinto mm. there also is a link between Shintoism and various of the Buddhist faiths like Pure Land Buddhism if you went on an excursion today you went to the Pure Land Beach right they, they um, they talked about it as Paradise Beach or Pure Land Beach. That's a direct reference um, out of Pure Land Buddhism that I'll discuss in a few minutes. So uh, this picture, by the way, is a picture representing the creation of the Japanese islands. These are two of the early kami, uh, Izanagi and Izanami, the male and the female. Izanagi um, is the one who invites. Um, Izanami is the one who is invited. And the legend is that they dipped a jeweled spear into the ocean, and when they pulled it out, the drops of water from this magical spear created the Japanese islands. And so that is the creation story uh, that is a Shinto story. In Japan today, there are about 81,000 Shinto shrines and about 85,000 Shinto priests, and it is the folk religion of Japan. A little bit more about the theology, what they believe. Uh, again, fundamentally, kami is the basis of it, the belief that there are gods or spirits. This is why, for instance, that they could say that the emperor is a, is a god, is a deity. Not the god, but a god, because the emperor is, as a person, it is seen as having a, a kami, a spirit about himself that will continue. Um, so the spiritual essence that inhabits all things, and they don't have to be animate, it can be a waterfall or a mountain or a, a stone. There's a reference in Shinto to Kanagara. It's out, actually Kanagara no Michi, which means the way of the kami. It's the natural order of things. And again, this sort of gets into Taoism, the idea that there's a flow that is a natural flow. And the goal in life, by reverencing the kami and your ancestors and the natural spirits in the world, that you come into a closer relationship to what is ancient and what is natural, and uh, therefore you, you can communicate more effectively with the kami. The shrines, and you'll see these, that's a, this is actually a bad example, it should have two cross pieces. But this, um, and I'll go back, uh, I'll go back. This is a Torii Gate. Torii Gate is always at the entrance of a Shinto shrine. 
it marks the separation between the secular world on the outside and the sacred area which is inside that gate. You sometimes will see mul multiple, um, off to the side, not usually as the main gate, but multiple Torii gates that are donated to the, as a, an expression of a belief in the sacredness of this place. And a, the shrine within the parameters of the Torii gate are considered quite literally the home of the kami. They are places that have been established to provide for the kami. And so you will have shrines at the locations of um, major waterfalls and mountains and rock formations and etc. And then you will have shrines as well with these Torii gates that are dedicated to individuals. Um, we recently visited a shrine that was to the, the third great shogun, the Tokugawa Ayesu, the the shogun of the, the last dynasty of shoguns, he founded it. Well, when he died, his, his son declared that he was a great kami, that he was still, basically still there. His tomb is there, but the tomb is behind the, um, the shrine that was built for him, believing that he is the great spirit that inhabits that place. So, um, kana, uh, the Kanagara no Michi, the idea is that the kami are invisible. But the more you come into an ability to commune with the kami, the more real they become to you. And so the kanagara no michi is the ability to commune with the kami in a more direct way, uh, to be more in tune with what they believe. And by the way, when you ever, uh, these gates, if you ever see a torii gate, a practitioner of Shinto will not walk right through the middle of that gate to get into the shrine. It's believed that that is the kami's uh, way. They will walk to one side, still inside the pillar, but to one side uh, next to the pillars as, as a show of respect for the fact that they are entering the sacred place where a kami or sometimes multiple kami may reside. Um, again, purity is a big deal, which is why outside these Torii gates you will often have a, um, a stone <laughs> basin with bamboo ladles. I've actually seen blue plastic ones too, but they're usually bamboo. And they, as an act of purification, you will take a scoop of water, and this is very pure mountain water, and you will wash your left hand, and then you will rinse, or rinse your left hand, you will rinse your right hand, and then you will rinse out your mouth. And that's just a way of purifying yourself, because purification is an important part of the Shinto faith. Um, the idea of kami, they, they have an expression, the yagyoruzu no kami, which means eight million kami. It doesn't mean between seven and nine million, it means a lot. There are a great many different spirits in the world that are kami, and especially around sacred places. Um, in terms of an afterlife, Shinto is, uh, their belief in an afterlife is very much like the Greek idea of Hades. Shomi, which is the uh, afterlife for Shinto, is a place of shadows and of darkness and of you know lack of clarity. If you die either in, a dishonorable death or an ordinary death, which is one of the reasons that Shinto warriors would choose to die a bold death. Because if you die in the name and defense of your country or in defense of your Lord or for a cause that is seen as righteous, then you can come back as a great kami, a guardian kami. And if you go to some Shinto shrines, as you enter the shrines, either at the Tori Gate or just inside that, they will have these large statues that look like Hindu demons. Those are intended to be guardians. And actually the Buddhist temples have, some, have adopted that as well. They sometimes will have these guardian spirits that will be protective of the shrine or the temple. And so this is the goal is to be, to come back in, a, in an honorable way rather than be committed to uh, show me the place of darkness and shadows. The, let's say it all together, Amino Manaka Nushi. Amino Manaka Nushi was the first kami to be born um, independently and therefore was considered the great um, founder of all of the other kami, one of the early uh, creator kamis. After that, there is the two that I mentioned already, the Japanese islands that came to be exist because of Azanagi, he who invites, and Azanami, she who is invited. The creation story is that when these two met one another, they walked around the great pillar of the earth and when they saw one another, Azanagi spoke, or Azanami, excuse, uh, the uh, woman spoke first, and she said, what joy beyond to com compare to see a man so fair. And Azanagi said, 
you weren't supposed to talk first. I'm the one who invites. You're the one who's invited. So they had to back up all the way back around the world pillar, come back out to one another again. And then Azanagi, the male kami, says, uh, to see a woman so fair, what joy beyond compare. Not very original, <laughs> since that's a, just a reverse of what uh, Azanami had just said. But now everything was okay, because they had gotten the order right. The one who invites spoke first. But that's the creation story that they have for the Japanese islands and for all of creation that exists. There are a number of different kinds of Shinto, and I'm going to go through these quickly uh, because it's, you're not going to run into a lot of this. Shrine Shinto is the thing you'll be most exposed to in Japan if you go to shrines because they are public shrines. They are the places that worship and events um, occur. That's where Shinto weddings occur. Uh, Carolyn and I have crashed two Shinto weddings over the last <laughs> couple of months, <laughs> and they're quite, quite the affair um, in terms of the the outfits they wear and whatnot. So Shrine Shinto uh, is almost all of the, there's an association of Shrine Shintos that take uh, uh, of Shinto shrines that take care of the vast majority of shrines in the country as a public affair. There also is Imperial Household Shinto. The Imperial Family of Japan have three uh, Shinto shrines on the Imperial grounds in Tokyo and only they uh, practice a particular kind of Shinto at those shrines. We then have folk Shinto, which is a series of kind of fragmented folk beliefs. There's a lot about this that some would consider superstitious. Um, it's sort of like, um, I'm from the South, so you know, Southern fundamentalist snake handlers kind of thing. They get into kind of weird ideas that are superstitious as much as anything else. Well, that's very much what folk Shinto. Uh, there's a lot of belief in different deities and spirits. There's divination, there's spirit possession, shamanic healing, a lot of other kinds of things that most Shintos don't, you know, don't follow. There is then shek, uh, sect Shinto. I'm getting my shizz mixed up today. Sect Shinto. These are private, local, religious community shrines. So they're not part of the uh, shrine Shinto, which is the public shrines. And they can be a number of different types. Pure Shinto, Confucian sects, mountain worship sects, purification sects, faith healing sects. All are private uh, sect Shinto. And then finally, I've talked a lot about the combination of Buddhism and Shinto. There is a kind of Shinto called Ko Shinto, literally old, old Shinto. Whenever you see Ko, it means old, the old ways. Um, so Ko Shinto is old Buddhism that seeks to restore Shinto to what it was before the Buddhist influence, which is a very difficult thing to do now because they are so interwoven. So that's a very quick introduction to Shinto. And now I want to talk about a little bit about the influences on Shinto and Buddhism, and then I'll talk about Buddhism. This, this image in the left side here is called the Vinegar Tasters, and it represents Buddhists, Taoists, and Confucianists. That's, they are called the three teachings in East Asia, starting in, in, obviously Buddhism started in India, but this comes from China. So these are the three great teachings, Taoism, Confucianism, and uh, Buddhism. This image on the right is a painting, and it's entitled, Confucius Presents a Young Buddha to Lao Tzu. Lao Tzu, or Lao Tzu, is the founder of Taoism. Confucius, or Kong Fu Zi, to use his Chinese name, is the founder of Confucianism. Buddha, obviously, is the founder of Buddhism. They all three lived at the same time. Buddha never got to China. He never met these two. In fact, there's, there's some belief that um, Lao Tzu and uh, Confucius may have bumped into each other, but we don't have any evidence of that per se. And they had, you know, similar but different kind of ideas. Uh, Taoism, the first, and Taoism, I often, uh, this Chinese character up here represents Taoism, but I often will use the yin and yang symbol. Because Taoism is the one that maintains that there is a balance in all of the world, there is a unity. Um, the material world, the spiritual world, the past, present, future, all things are relative, all things are in balance. It emphasizes spontaneity and empty, emptiness, this idea that there is a force that ties everything together, all physical things and all spiritual things. Um, kind of the best, the best way to understand that idea, the Tao as it's called, and by the way, it's spelled with a T or a D, in the 1950s, they began to change the way that Chinese words were transliterated into English. And that's why it's now Mao, Mao, uh, Mao Zedong instead of Mao Zedong. You get a lot fewer 
uh, apostrophes and hyphens nowadays. They use a system called pinyin now, and it's different. So Taoism or Lao Tzu or Lao Tzu, those are changes that occurred. But the Tao is best represented, and I think people can understand this, from Star Wars. The idea of the Force. And by the way, yesterday was Star Wars Day. You know, May the 4th? May the 4th be with you? You know about that, right? Okay. Um, should have said something yesterday. May the 4th be with you. But in Star Wars, it's all about the Force. You know, let the Force you know, flow with the force, allow the force to work through you. This, nat this natural, almost supernatural uh, flow of things that, that ties everything together. That's the Tao. They very much took that from the idea of Taoism. And so Tao has been a great influence on both Shinto and Buddhism uh, in the East. The other I would mention briefly is Confucianism or Ruism. Uh, Ru Ruism, this character here is the character Ru and it means scholar. Confucius was a guy who um, developed his own rather complex system, not so much of religious belief, and, and same thing with, uh, with Lao Tzu and Taoism. There was not a talk about God, but rather about just the force that holds everything together. With Confucius, he was much more concerned about designing a social system that will allow everybody to be able to uh, live well together and to be productive in society. He had a very strong emphasis on familial duty and loyalty, uh, particularly loyalty, not just to your family, but to the person uh, above you in society. Um, Confucius was big on saying everybody needed to figure out where they fit in, in society, what responsibilities were associated with that place in society, and then fulfill those to the best of your power, being loyal to those above you. And the problem with Confucianism is that especially later when it, there was a neo-Confucianism that came out of China to Korea and Japan. In Korea especially, it almost limited people's ability to improve society because everybody was told they needed to stay in their place. So there was not a whole lot of room for advancement or doing more advanced things in society. But Confucius literally traveled around trying to get various rulers and lords to hire him to uh, put his ideas in place. And he struggled with that for a long time, but eventually Confucianism became perhaps the most important philosophical system, more than religious system, in China and greatly affected the other belief systems. All right, now, we'll talk about Buddhism. Again, I mentioned Taoism and Confucianism. There's a little bit of that in, China, in Japan, but more that the Japanese religions are influenced by those. That's why I talked about them. Buddhism was founded sometime around uh, sixth, early, the 6th century, 560 to 490 BC, um, by a man named the Siddhartha Gautama, Siddhartha Gautama Buddha. Buddha literally means enlightened one or awakened one. It's a title, not a name, although they refer to him as the Buddha. Um, there are several major traditions of Buddhism. Theravada is, uh, means the school of elders. It is the original kind of Buddhism that Siddhartha Gautama uh, came up with and taught. And we think of it as being in India, but actually it's in uh, the, the town where he lived and traveled around from is in southern Nepal now. So the Nepalese keep insisting that Buddhism is a Nepalese religion, not an Indian religion, but at that point it was all one. So Theravada Buddhism is what the Siddhartha Gautama taught. Much of it is related to the idea of incarnation because it came out of Hinduism. Hinduism is very oriented toward the idea of um, samsara, that every person is born, they live a life of suffering, they die, and then they are reborn. And they live a life of suffering, and they die, and then they're reborn. And so the focus was, how do we take the suffering out of that equation? The other, other doctrines in Theravada Buddhism have to do with the karma. You know, how you act, how you live your life will have an effect on not only what happens to you in this life, but will happen, uh, affect you, how you come back, what your next life is going to be. Because of this cycle of birth, life, death, and rebirth, the samsara. Um, I was teaching Buddhism one time in one of my roommates, long before I met Carolyn, um, he said, so let me get this straight. If I am a Buddhist, and I, or Hindu, either one, and I live a good life, I will come back as another person and get to try to do better. If I live a really good life, 
I don't have to come back at all. This is nirvana. Nirvana does not mean heaven in the original Buddhist idea. It means nothingness. It means to literally be snuffed out, that you don't have to come back and suffer anymore. So my roommate said, so if I'm really, really good, I don't have to come back. And if I'm really, really bad, I have to come back as a beetle. And I said, well, yeah, that's pretty much it. You know, that kind of the, the idea of samsara, this rebirth, that's a pretty good way of understanding it. Um, well, this whole idea of the suffering and getting rid of suffering and most of the original teaching that the uh, Siddhartha Gautama had did not fit in the context when Buddhism moved to the East. Um, the original Buddhism had no concept of God. Siddhartha Gautama did not talk about God at all. Most of it was had to do with reincarnation. Well, in China and Korea and Japan, they did not have a concept of reincarnation. And so all of that fell away. And so the Eastern Asian version of Buddhism is called Mahayana Buddhism, which includes a number, a Mahayana means the great vehicle, and it's the great vehicle because there's a whole lot of different kinds of Buddhism taking a ride on it. Um, and so that's the East Asian version. Pure Land Buddhism, Zen Buddhism, Nichiren, uh, Tibetan or Vajrayana Buddhism, and others. So very different kinds of ideas about Buddhism. Um, the, the story of the original Buddha was that he was born, Siddhartha Gautama was born as a young prince. He was very wealthy. His father was the king of the region. And when he was just a baby, this uh, prophet, soothsayer, came through and told his father that his son, Gautama was either going to be a great uh, leader and ruler, or he was going to be a great holy man. Well, Gautama's father did not want him to be a religious man. He wanted him to take over the family business and be a ruler. And so he pretty much locked him in the castle for most of his young life and gave him everything he wanted. He knew nothing but pleasure uh, and self-indulgence. He got anything he wanted. But then, and, and the, the soothsayer had said, all of this will be depending on, depend on what he sees in the world. And so that's why his father locked him in the, in the castle, or it wasn't a castle, the palace. Um, the, later on, as a young adult, Gautama gets out of the palace and goes out, and he has what's called the four sights. He sees a corpse, a dead person, a sick man, a, uh, an aged man, a very old person, and an ascetic who is starving himself to try to achieve some kind of enlightenment. Those four sights convinced the Buddha that he needed to spend his life trying to find an understanding of all of this suffering that he had seen in the world. And so he did. He learned to meditate. He studied with spiritual masters. But meditation didn't give him any, any pleasure. He, he had already experienced self-indulgence, and he knew that didn't work. He went into a period of asceticism. And you'll see this kind of images in South Asia, um, particularly the Southeast Asia in Vietnam and, and Thailand and places, where they sometimes will show a, a starving Buddha. You know, he looks emaciated. And that's the period of asceticism, when he was starving, he almost starved himself to death, apparently. And that didn't give him uh, enlightenment. And so he said, okay, indulging yourself doesn't do it. You know, uh, denying yourself doesn't give you uh, truth, and so there must be a middle way, and Buddhism has become known as the middle way because of that. He finally sat down underneath the Bodhi tree, famously, it's a ficus religiosa, we don't know what kind of tree it was, and said he was not going to get up until he achieved enlightenment. After several days, he did. He came to an understanding of the cause of human suffering and what can be done about it. Not that nobody was ever going to have physical pain again, but how can we deal with all of the things that happen in our life? Physical pain, grief, um, and, you know, illness, everything, in, impending death, in a way that we can accept without it being as much suffering. And what he came up with, the first part of it is called the Four Noble Truths. This is an understanding of the human condition that, that the Siddhartha Gautama Buddha um, developed and taught. The first is the truth of dukkha. Dukkha is the word for suffering. And again, it means illness, anxiety, stress, trying to hold on to things that we want, but that change on us, dissatisfaction, lack of permanence, etc. So all of life involves those kinds of things. Secondly, the second noble truth is the origin of dukkha is our clinging and craving to pleasure and are trying to flee uh, to have aversion to what is not pleasurable. 
and this causes an imbalance in terms of uh, we're always struggling and striving, and that, caught, that creates the sense of suffering. The third great truth is the cessation of dukkha is to put an end to the craving, which much of which is caused by ignorance, to understand the cause and problems, to stop craving and clinging to things that we find pleasurable, to stop <laughs> fleeing from things that are natural that we, we suffer from. And the, finally, the truth of the liberation from dukkha is to follow the noble eightfold path. Now, a couple of other things you need to understand. I mentioned the samsara, that is the, uh, what's called reincarnation uh, by most people. Transmigration of the soul is the, is the technical term, but samsara is the uh, Hindu and Buddhist term. The idea of karma, that your actions, what you do has an effect on how you live. Um, also, the idea of the Buddha, Buddha means the awakened one, the enlightened one. And in Buddhism, there have been many different Buddhas. There's not just one. I'll talk about Pure Land and some others in a second. And so there have been many different Buddhas that were fully awakened. He was just the first, Siddhartha Gautama. Also, there are another set of beings called Bodhisattvas. How many of y'all are Steely Dan fans? Steely Dan fans? Okay. 1973, there was a song, Bodhisattva. Um, and Steely Dan, the worst of that are Bodhisattva, would you take me by the hand? Bodhisattva, would you take me by the hand? Can you show me the shine of your Japan, the sparkle of your China? Can you show me Bodhisattva, Bodhisattva? A Bodhisattva is a being that is, is at the edge of enlightenment and could go ahead and become a full-fledged awakened Buddha, but decides not to in order to be able to, to help other people, to take them by the hand, if you will, and lead them to enlightenment. So you have the enlightened Buddhas, and then you have the Bodhisattvas who are near enlightenment who decide to not step over that threshold yet because they want to help more people. Uh, and that's where the whole Bodhisattva thing came from, and I'm glad that there are some Steely Dan fans. I, I, the idea of asking that question having nobody raised their hand would really depress me. So uh, anyway. <laughs> so this is the cause of suffering in life that the Buddha talked about. And the Eightfold Path, or often talked about as the middle way, is one, you have to have right view, which means you have to understand the nature of dukkha. You have to accept the Four Noble Truths. Secondly, it's a right understanding. Secondly, right intention. You have to have the right thoughts and the right aspirations. Third, right speech. You cannot participate in speaking falsehood, abuse, or chatter. Fourth, right action. You must act morally and cause no harm. Fifth, right livelihood, which means no working with weapons, degradation, meat, intoxicants, or poisons. Sixth, you must pursue the right effort, meaning discipline, thought, work, word, and deed. You must work on this. Seven, you have to have right mindfulness, that is being alert to everything around you that affects you. Um, and eight, right concentration, that is meditate in the right way and on the right things. This was the way to get out of the suffering of dukkha and to eventually achieve, achieve enlightenment. And to the original Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, that meant to be enlightened, to achieve nirvana, to no longer exist, quite literally. Nirvana. Today, they often use it interchangeably with heaven. That's not the original idea about it in, in Buddhism, in the Indian sense of the, the Dharmic Buddhism. So Buddhism in East Asia, and particularly in Japan. As of 2014, there were 377,000 Buddhist monks, priests, and leaders in Japan. Buddhism came over to Japan in the middle of the 6th century. 552 AD is usually the date that they give. And from the time it came over, from, from India to China, China to, to Korea, Korea to Japan in the 550s AD, uh, it has been a major influence in Japan. As I said, 60% of Japanese will have what's called a Butsudan, which is a Buddhist shrine in their home. Carolyn and I actually wandered into a shop in one of the Japanese cities. The whole shop were shrines, these beautiful wooden cabinets, various sizes, that you could, you know, uh, and some of them they had set up to sort of give an illustration of what you could do in your own home. They would have images of the Buddha and offerings to the Buddha, etc. So again, 80% of Japanese have a Shinto shrine, a Kamidana, and 60% have a uh, Butsudan, which is a Buddhist shrine in their homes. The 12th century, when the shoguns, if you heard my earlier lecture about shoguns, when the shoguns took over the country and made the emperor just a figurehead, they, they fell in love with Buddhism, especially Zen Buddhism that we'll talk about. And they made it so important 
to the military, uh, the samurai, the way of Bushido, that when the Meiji Emperor took his, took his power back in the 1860s, he at first tried to push Buddhism to the side in favor of Shinto, and later he tried to eradicate it because so many people associated with the shoguns and the samurai, and the Meiji Emperor tried to get rid of that. There are a number of different kinds of Buddhism uh, that we'll talk about, and the first one I want to talk about is Pure Land of Buddhism. Again, the beach we went to today, the monks who came there said, this is paradise, this is the Pure Land. The idea behind Pure Land Buddhism, it is the most faith-oriented of any of the Buddhist uh, sects or uh, options. The idea here, uh, they believe that the Buddhas are not merely humans, that they actually are projections of divine beings that have always existed. And particularly, they focus on this fellow in the middle, who is the Amida Butsu, the Amida Buddha. He is the divine being of light, the Buddha of divine light, provides light to the world. And the idea here, as I say, it's the, the most faith-oriented. The beliefs of Pure Land Buddhism, and it's the largest kind of Buddhism in Japan, the most common, is that we desire a, um, a better world, and yet we will never be able to get away from the corruption in this world, no matter what we do. So therefore, if we have faith in the Amida Buddha, the sinner guy, then that Amida Buddha will take us out of this life when we die and take us to the Pure Land or the Western Paradise. And that beach that was so beautiful today, the monks said, this is what paradise must look like. This is the Pure Land Beach. Um, the two guys on the side, these are bodhisattvas, uh, these almost enlightened beings who are assistants of the Amida Buddha. And so the idea in this faith-oriented form of Buddha is if you chant the name, actually you chant an expression of faith, Namu Amida Butsu, the name of Amida Butsu, uh, the Buddhist, Buddha, Amida Buddha, and some people say if you only say that once in real faith, that's sufficient. There's another branch of um, Pure Land Buddhism that says the more you say it, the better off you are. And so they will chant this as a regular meditation. But uh, it's, it's faith in the Amida Buddha to save you and to take you to paradise. Sounds very much like a, a more Western religion. Nothing at all like the original um, Theravada Buddhism out of India. There was no salvation. There was no cure for your karma except to do better next time. Um, and so this is a very different kind of idea, but this is the most common Buddhism in Japan. The second most common kind of Buddhism is called Nichiren Buddhism. Nichiren Buddhism started in the 1200s. This statue is of the priest whose name was Nichiren. He um, developed a series of writings and teachings. And so those who follow Nichiren First, they undertake this as the approach to the faith. Secondly, they study Nichiren's writings. And third, they chant, especially the Lotus Sutra, which is probably the most famous of all of the sutras. A sutra is a, is a poetic um, meditation piece that you recite, and you, you will recite over and over. Some of them are very short, some are longer. The Lotus Sutra is, is, is pretty long. Um, there is two different groups. Well, there's 37 different groups of Nichiren Buddhists now. Two of the largest ones are split over the issue of whether or not Nichiren was himself a bodhisattva or not. And so they, you know, they drew a line there. The, um, the beliefs include the idea that all people have the potential to become Buddha, to become enlightened now, and that you can do so by your own effort. You don't need something else. Um, and that you are encouraged to pursue your own enlightenment. There's also a very strong emphasis, and this has gotten them in trouble. It's one of the reasons they have 37 different sex of Nietzsche in Buddhism is because they've gotten in trouble and some people have split off and split off and split off because they emphasize social responsibility and socio-political involvement. And so they've gotten involved a lot in political issues and how that affects people, which has not made them very popular on a number of occasions with the government of Japan. Um, and it has, it's created problems for them. But they are probably the most socially active of all the Buddhisms. Well, i got two more I'm going to talk about. Shingon Buddhism. Shingon literally means true words, and the way you can recognize this one, it's actually an esoteric brand of Buddhism, similar to Tibetan Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism. Um, you can tell from the kind of images, um, you know, this kind of, of image here, it takes a lot of its theology directly from Hinduism. A lot of the deities from Hinduism have been brought over into uh, Shingon Buddhism, as well as another kind of Buddhism, Tendai Buddhism. They have uh, even Indra, the Hindu king of heaven, 
is a deity in Shingon Buddhism. And when you go to, uh, often if you go to a temple to Kanon, Kanon is the god of the Buddha of mercy, um, you will see these kinds of images, um, guardian, almost demons, protecting the various uh, Buddhist images that are there. And so a lot of, of Hindu theology has been brought over into Shingon. And you'll see um, it's from a, a priest, and this is, this is him in the corner, named Kukai, who brought it over uh, into Japan. The last kind of Buddhism I want to talk about is the one you've probably heard about, and that is Zen Buddhism. It began in China, called, it was called Chan Buddhism, then to Korea it was called Sion Buddhism, and in Japan it's called Zen Buddhism. It is from the Dharmic word, or the Sanskrit word, that means meditation. The idea in Zen Buddhism is that your personal, that, that your enlightenment is entirely dependent upon you having a personal breakthrough that is to be had by meditation. Um, you can meditate as much as the, and they take this model from the Buddha. He sat under the Bodhi, the Bodhi tree until he achieved enlightenment. So there are three main schools of Zen Buddhism in Japan. The, the largest one is called Soto Buddhism. Soto follows uh, a, a process called uh, Shikantaza, Shikantaza literally means just sitting around. And the idea that you sit and you meditate, as these two uh, monks are, in an effort to achieve personal enlightenment. The second largest um, of the Buddhist <coughs> schools in Japan is called Rinzai. Rinzai make use of the koans. And you've all heard these, at least one of them. The koan is a riddle or puzzle that's intended to challenge your faith in your rationality to make you really question uh, how much you really know, to break down the barriers that prevent you from being open to greater truths. The one you've all heard, I'm sure, is what is the sound of one hand clapping? You've heard that, right? Yeah. Well, the process in uh, Rinzai is that a Buddhist master will present one of these koans, these, these riddles, to students. And the students are to go and meditate on it and think about it and consider it and then come back and tell the, um, the master what they have discovered in their meditation, what they believe the meaning of it is. And then the master will you know, guide them in terms of are they getting there, are they not, did you really mess up, start all over again, or whatever it is. One of the ones that i fascinated by, and it's very, very well known, uh, a Rinzai koan was, if you meet the Buddha, kill the Buddha. The first time I did this lecture on the ships, a guy three days later came up to me and said, I've been thinking about that ever since you gave that talk. And I've been talking to people about it. We've talked about it every night. I think I have an answer. And so he still, I said, well, I'm not really a Zen master, but I'll be happy to listen to you if you want. Though. So if you want to find out what that conversation was, again, buy me a cup of coffee sometime. The third kind of uh, Zen school is uh, Obaku. They follow very strict monastic order, but they primarily are known as being the, uh, a Chinese style that focuses on the use of art, like calligraphy, or the tea ceremony, or various other kinds of expression um, as ways of meditating. And that's their primary focus. Those are the three. The Soto, the just sitting around, Rinzai, the use of the riddles or mysteries, and then Obaku, the uh, use of creative arts. All of these, uh, Zen Buddhism probably more than any of the others, is, is influenced by Taoism. Uh, coming out of China, which is where Zen Buddhism started as well. So these are the religions in Japan. I've gone, I usually go 45 minutes. I've gone a few minutes longer than that. Any questions about any of those? Do you feel like you have a basic... Don't laugh. Uh, <laughs> particularly Shinto, I think, is the one that people know least about, but understanding the kami, the spirits that they, you know, that they show reverence for and they will make offering to, uh, etc. But any questions about any of that? Yes? A general question. Um, how far back in history can you trace religious thought? Or you know, some, something that indicates there was an idea of spiritualism? How far back in history can we trace the idea of religious belief or spiritualism? There has never been any society ever that we have any evidence of that did not have religious belief of some kind. A belief in God or gods, deities, afterlife, something. Um, it is widely considered, you know, 
modern you know modern day people talk about atheism and that that uh, religion somehow seems false to them because it's just unnatural there's never been a group of people ever in history that we know about that didn't have religious belief of some kind uh, some sociologists would insist that religious uh, believe a sense of the divine a sense of uh, existence greater than ourselves may be an inherent sense as much so as seeing or hearing or tasting um, and there, that's called reformed epistemology epistemology is how you know things and so now you're getting into my wheelhouse when you start talking about that stuff and so there's uh, there's very much there there's no you know we can talk about this is when these religions started but before all of that there were animistic religions um, you know that basically recognize people I, I sometimes draw a line between uh, perceived religions and religions of revelation perceived religions would be in ancient times they would see a huge storm in the mountains and the next thing they know there's a flood coming down the river destroying their crops and an effort to try to explain that and understand it and to assign deities to it that maybe if maybe there's some being there and if we can do something to make that being not be angry with us then they won't destroy our crops those are the perceived religions and animism being the oldest version of that but then the, uh, the religions of revelation are primarily the monotheistic religions Judaism Christianity and Islam the idea is they're they're not based upon what people perceived but what God said to them God delivered a message you know to the Jews to the Christians and to the Muslims and that's why they have holy writings that's why they're the people of the book that's just one way to understand the differences um, but I hope that answers your question. Yeah, to a certain extent, but did the, um, the religions that came later, like the monotheistic religions, did they, they don't seem to have evolved from some of these religions like Buddhism and Shinto. And right. Was there, uh, was there any contact between those peoples that might have uh, influenced the start of the uh, So was there contact and where, you know, how did we get down to this? There are a lot of people who believe today that monotheism was the original version of religion. That monotheism existed because of the simplicity of it, basically. You know, you don't have multiple gods, multiple... That that may have been the original, and then it devolved into, um, into polytheistic religions, um, many gods or many spirits, and then later on, you know, God uh, revealed himself in a way to bring them back to that. So I'm getting into a lot of detail here now, but that's, you know, we can talk about that later if you want to. But that's, you know, in terms of the history of it, there are serious questions as to where did, where did it all start and how did it evolve and how is it connected? Um, so, other questions? Yes? I was just wondering, how did the samurai of ancient times reconcile their appearance to Buddhism? Right. Well, they didn't have to fit Right. Well, um, how did the samurai, who followed Zen Buddhism particularly, I mean, they were also um, they were also part of the Shinto religion. You know, there was the combination. How did they resolve the not working with weapons, which is the no degradation uh, aspect of the uh, eight uh, eight noble truths? The surprisingly, people think that Buddhism has always been a religion of, of peace, and it hasn't. There have been times when Buddhists have taken up arms. Um, there has been persecution of, in parts of Asia of Christian churches by Buddhists, and people don't realize that. So I guess the only thing I can say is that in every religion, whatever the tenets of that religion are, there have always been people who found it more convenient not to listen to that part. Okay? <laughs> the, to, you know, to emphasize this instead of this. You know, people talk about that, that the, who haven't read it will say that the Quran is full of all this violence and how you know you must kill the infidel. Well, I've read the Quran twice, and there is more in there about being patient with other people and letting people worship their own gods and not forcing them into belief in Allah. Then, and, and that was expressed through much of the early rise of, of Islam in you know the Islamic uh, the caliphate that was in uh, Spain and Portugal. Christians, Jews, uh, Muslims got along famously. It was no problem. And so there is much in the Quran, and I think often we quote only half of something, and this is true not just in Islam, but in Christianity and everything else. We only quote the half or the part we like. You know, I, I once was playing racquetball with a good friend, and I, if you've ever played racquetball, it's not hard to hit the other person with the ball, and I hit him really hard, and I said, I am so sorry. He said, that's all right, vengeance is mine, I will repay. And I said, but Paul, the rest of that is, says the Lord. And he said, I ain't quoting that part. 
Well, that's exactly what people do. Whether they are, you know, samurai, Zen Buddhists, whether they are Christian, whatever. And I'm, I'm a strong advocate that you have to take the whole thing. So, any other questions? We got it all sorts. Did you have some? No. Oh, you scratch your nose and I'll call on you. Yes. Mm -hmm. How do you, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Well, the Greek philosophy arising at the same time. Uh, the Greek and Romans had a pantheon of gods that were basically the same. Because both Greek and Romans were big fans of syncretism. Meaning, when, uh, you know, when the Greeks would move into an area, or particularly when the Romans conquered an area, and they would say, okay, this is the local god. You know, this is the god of our volcano, or whatever it is. Um, then, and when they conquered you know, areas around Greece, and they had this whole pantheon, they said, well, that's really cool. Those sound a lot like our gods. So, as of now, they are our gods, and they just <laughs> use two different names for them. You know, there, are, um, there are Greek and there are Roman names for the same gods in the dual pantheons. So for the Greeks and the Romans, any god that came along was fine with them. One of the big problems they had with the early Christians, the Jews were given a pass because Julius Caesar really liked the Jewish people. He thought they were learned and they were valuable and he let them alone. Um, but when Christians came along, once they identified them as being different than, than the Jewish people as a unique group, the big persecution against the, uh, the Christians by the Romans was because of the fact that they would not worship the other gods. And that was considered, um, because they wouldn't worship the emperor, that was considered treasonous, because they wouldn't worship all the other gods, that was considered antisocial. And they made up all sorts of, you know, ideas about them, that the love feast that the Christian groups were having was actually cannibalism because they heard that they ate the body and drank the blood of their master and all kinds of stuff because this was a group unlike everything else the Romans and the Greeks had believed that would not accept other gods than just the one and but that was the tradition and the Roman philosophers for the most part were right there interestingly enough Socrates was a monotheist uh, according to what Plato wrote about it. He did not believe in multiple gods. He didn't think that made sense. So anyway, I'm getting a whole different, you know, maybe we'll have a different set of lectures. So, you know, we'll do a midnight series of lectures on religions if you want to. So thank you all very much. I'll be back tomorrow and uh, we'll be talking about Japanese gardens. Thank you.